Well, good evening. The, uh, this evening it is a privilege once again to be with you all, even in this uh, limited way, and uh, we look forward to the next Lord's Day when we'll uh, be able to gather in person. Uh, in the meantime, as you've already heard in the announcements, the uh, campus continues to be closed for this time. The uh, Wednesday evening service will stream at 6.30 uh, as usual, and we'll have that as a, as a way to continue worshiping the Lord together. Uh, but we do look forward to this time when we're no longer apart, but able to gather together more fully as the body of Christ. Uh, for this evening, we're going to be uh, wrapping up this brief look that we've had at uh, church history, looking at some different individuals, some different uh, persons that the Lord has used throughout the, the history of the church. And we've really only, uh, I, I wouldn't even say that we've scratched the surface with the way that we've looked at just a handful of individuals ranging from uh, Ignatius and Polycarp, Charles Spurgeon, uh, some of the folks we looked at last week, John Rogers, William Tyndall, John Wycliffe, um, and so we, we have just a, a few more that we're going to consider this evening. I will tell you, I am looking forward to, uh, getting back to our series in Genesis and Lord willing, we'll be back there on this, uh, next Sunday evening as we gather. But for this evening, uh, I want to consider for our text, sort of a jumping off point, uh, the glory of the gospel in the lives in the, the, the great and the small individual. So I'd invite you to turn with me to first Corinthians, first Corinthians chapter one. In the opening chapters of 1 Corinthians, Paul is rebuking a, a, a certain sectarian spirit that's rising up among the believers in, in, in Corinth. Uh, when I teach New Testament survey to our students here at CCA, one of the things that'll happen as we walk through 1 Corinthians is the students are um, in a worksheet. They have to write down how many different things the, the Apostle Paul is uh, correcting or rebuking through the book of 1 Corinthians just in the first few chapters. Uh, and there are a number of things, but the first thing that he begins to address is these sort of uh, personality cults that were springing up among the people, where they were sort of declaring their allegiance to some of the various workmen that the Lord had used in bringing them the gospel and bringing them along in the faith. They were identifying with those teachers and they were, they were essentially saying, well, I, I'm a follower of this man. He's the one who discipled me. This one baptized me. Uh, I'm of that party. Uh, the, the super spiritual ones were saying, well, I'm not any of them. I'm a follower of Jesus. I don't know why you guys are following men. And, and Paul begins to sort of rebuke that spirit Beginning in verse 10 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you may be complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I've been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, and I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was, not crucified for, uh, Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that none of you were baptized in my name. Now I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross would not be made void. Well, the, the chief way that Paul is going about correcting this is saying this isn't about us. It's not about the workmen. It's not about these individuals whom the Lord used as instruments to deliver the message to or to accomplish his work. It's about the one for whom we're laboring. And, and one of the ways that he's going to begin transitioning in this argument or in this rebuke and in this correction over the next several verses is the way that he finishes up verse 17 there. He says, I, I didn't come preaching in cleverness of speech so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. He says, I, I don't want anyone to ever say, well, I believed because Paul was just so winsome. He was just so clever. He was so um, uh, uh, dazzling with his oratorial, uh, oratorial skills that, that I, I just couldn't resist the message. And that's why I believed because of Paul. In the wisdom of the world, people could have their favorite philosopher. They could have their favorite teacher. They could have one who was exalted among themselves. But God, Paul tells us, in his wisdom, 
is pleased to use the weak and base things. He's pleased to use the foolishness of the cross, the foolishness of preaching to accomplish his purpose. So that there's only one who could be exalted in the gospel. And that's the Lord himself. He, he does this so that it's plain that he alone receives the glory. In many of the videos that we've been putting out recently, while we've been apart, one of the things that we've mentioned is having this treasure in a jar of clay. An analogy that Paul's going to use to this church at Corinth. And in it, one of the things that he's making the point of is it's not about the jar. It's not about the vessel. Rather, it's the treasure that we carry. Because the gospel, the treasure of the message of Christ preached, the Lord has so orchestrated and designed his plan for the progress of the gospel so that he alone receives the glory and not any man. Look with me just a few verses further in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen. The things that are not. So that he may nullify the things that are. So that no man may boast before God. But by his doing you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boast, boast in the Lord. Paul says, just, just look around. Look at yourselves. The Lord isn't looking for some all-star team. There's not many wise, not many mighty, not many noble. Not many. But it doesn't say none. You know, one of the things that I'm afraid sometimes that we can get caught up in is the newest Jesus spokesman celebrity. We hear about some uh, athlete, some celebrity figure, some musician, someone high profile, maybe even in a governmental position or something like that. And we think, man, this is great. If we could just get this person. It, it happens so frequently that some athlete, that some uh, star, some person like that will will. Uh, reveal to the public that they're a Christian. They have been all this time or maybe they've just become one and there's sort of a hubbub among the general Christianity of just, wow, this is great. Isn't this wonderful? I, I remember a few years back this happened with a particular athlete while I was teaching here in the high school and uh, the students came in and, and I, I don't know if it had happened in an interview or, or how it came to be but this this athlete had come and said, yeah, I'm a Christian and, and made this statement of, of their uh, identification with Christ. And within a, shoo, a few short weeks, that athlete had, had uh, been doing things on the court that were not very Christ-like. And all the students were sort of like, yeah, I, I don't know. No, I don't know what to do with this. I don't, because he's a Christian, but I, I'm afraid that sometimes we think that Jesus needs a new PR agent. He needs some new person to handle the press, to be his great new spokesperson for his cause. But the word makes it really clear that he doesn't because he's got you and me. Now that might sound a little strange and you might say, well, <laughs> that, that's not good news. It, it's just us. We're the ones who are the face of Christianity. Well, y yeah, actually. Again, the Lord has chosen the base things, me and you. The foolish things, the, the low things of this world so that no one can boast before God. So that all will see, yeah, they're actually just like in the book of Acts. These are just Galileans and yet they speak the things of God. And truthfully, that's one of the great struggles in considering these little mini bi biographies that we've been doing on Sunday night is how to do it well without losing sight of the reality that this isn't about the people. It's not about these individuals that we've uh, learned more about. It's ultimately, it's about their Lord. 
as much as we may admire and, and uh, be thankful for the memory and for the example of those who have gone before who have run the race well, we can be thankful for them, but we have to recognize constantly and constantly remind ourselves that they are mere men and it's not about them. They're, they're men. They're just instruments. They're just tools in the hands of the Lord. And that ultimately, for them, they would be most displeased if we made it all about them and not about their Lord. And one of the great ballasts or one of the great aids in keeping that is considering a text like this one. That it's not the person's rank or status or skills per se that made them so valuable, that, that caused them to be the instruments through which the Lord worked at a particular time. It was that they yielded themselves to the Lord at that time, that they were faithful. That these individuals, that they, as we considered last week, that they didn't know in the moment the grand impact that they were going to have. They could not see, they could not have foreseen just how the Lord would use their sacrifice. Yet they were faithful. For most of them, and even many of the ones that we considered, especially last week, we considered those that were, were, were incredibly gifted intellectually. They were scholars, they were they were polyglots. That means they, they knew many, many languages. And yet, we have to continually remind ourselves and be reminded. Well, even though I'm not that, the Lord is pleased to use me as I am faithful, as I'm yielded to him. So tonight, we're going to consider two more figures from the, the English Reformation period, the same time frame, roughly, that we looked at last week. And we're going to swing wildly along the social strata. We're, we're going to go from highs to lows. We're going to begin this evening with someone I made mention of last week, just in passing, but someone who's incredibly used by our Lord. Edward VI was the, the child king. He, he died when he was 15. He had reigned for only about six years but he made an incredible impact upon the English-speaking world and the freedom of the church. Uh, Edward had been born to Henry VIII, who broke England from the Roman Catholic Church, but hadn't really de-Romanized it. He had begun sort of the Reformation in England. However, he didn't get very far. Edward, on the other hand, his son, was remarkably devout. He was someone who took his duty very seriously. Even contemporaries who wrote many years later who had been his childhood friends remembered and recalled that he was someone who was very sober, very serious, because he recognized he had a task. He would labor during his brief reign to set the church in England on the right track. However, very quickly after becoming the king of England, he fell ill. And at 15, he and the Regency Council drew up a plan to maintain that the church and that England itself would remain outside of the Roman Catholic Church. He had half-siblings, Mary and Elizabeth, and he drew up a, a plan, drew up a device to make sure that they could not take the throne. Mary, who was the oldest, would be most likely, and she was staunchly, ardently Roman Catholic. So Edward made plans for his cousin, Lady Jane Grey, to secede him on the throne. Lady Jane Grey would be assisted to the throne. She would reign for less than two weeks before Edward's half-sister Mary, who we remember as Bloody Mary, would take the throne and begin a reign of terror, attempting to reverse Edward's step away from the Roman Catholic Church. Mary, during that, that brief time between the death of Edward and uh, Lady Jane Grey taking the throne and, and taking up residence in the Tower of London, she would seize control and she manipulated much of the government and, and the populace to, to come behind her and she proclaimed herself queen. She made her way to the throne and had Jane Grey imprisoned in the Tower of London where she had taken up residence. Now, Lady Jane Grey was the, the granddaughter of Henry VII. She was brought up as English nobility. And she had a very fine upbringing. She was <clears throat> uh, very, very uh, well taken care of, well educated. She had a tremendous education. 
uh, of her upbringing, she, she regarded it as very strict because of how scrupulous, how, how careful and close her parents were in regard to uh, her doing everything well. That education enabled her that by the time she was 16, about the age when she became queen, she was already regularly reading the New Testament in Greek. As soon as Mary had solidified her hold on the throne of England and other religious leaders had been placed in prominent positions and Mary began putting to death those who were her opponents and Jane was brought to be beheaded. Fox's Book of Martyrs, which was written and recorded specifically in response to some of the persecutions that broke out as a result of Mary's rule, records this about Jane on the scaffold. When she first mounted the scaffold, she spoke to the spectators in this manner. Good people, I am come hither to die, and by a law I am condemned to the same. The fact against the Queen's Highness was unlawful, and the consenting thereunto by me, but touching the procurement and desire thereof by me or on my behalf, I do wash my hands thereof in innocency before God and the face of you good Christian people this day. In other words, she says, this is wrong, and the thing that I'm accused of, I'm innocent, Then she said, I pray you all, good Christian people, to bear me witness that I die a good Christian woman, that I do look to be saved by no other means but only by the mercy of God and the blood of his only son, Jesus Christ. And I confess that when I did know the word of God, I neglected the same, loved myself and the world, and therefore this plague and punishment has happily and worthily happened unto me for my sins, and yet I thank God that of his goodness he has thus given me a time and a respite to repent. And now, good people, while I am alive, I pray you assist me with your prayers. And then kneeling down, she turned to the man that was attending her, saying, shall I say this psalm? And she said, Psalm 51, in English, in a most devout manner throughout to the end. And then she stood up and gave her maid, Mrs. Ellen, her gloves and her handkerchief, her book to Mr. Bruges, and then she prepared herself. One of her gentlewomen gave her a fair handkerchief to put around her eyes. Then the executioner kneeled down and asked her forgiveness, whom she forgave most willingly. Then he desired her to stand upon the straw, which doing she saw the block. Then she said, I pray you dispatch me quickly. And she kneeled down saying, will you take it off, referring to the blindfold? Will you take it off before I lay me down? The ex executioner said, no, madam. And she tied a handkerchief about her eyes and feeling for the block, she said, what shall I do? Where is it? Where is it? One of the standers by guiding her thereunto, she laid her head upon the block and then stretched forth her body and said, Lord, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And so finished her life in the year of our Lord, 1554, the 12th day of February, about the 17th year of her age. Her reign was brief. Her life was brief. And yet, the Lord used it in a mighty, mighty way. This example of her nobility and her death. She's this young queen. She is one of the few mighty, the wise, the noble. Yet even she was not exempt from suffering. One of the other things that I hope we've seen throughout this brief consideration of the history of the church is the reality that we have no reason to expect exemption from suffering. Even when the Lord does have the mighty, the noble, the wise, sometimes they too face the block and the executioner. This shouldn't surprise us. I'm not going to take the time, but I'd encourage you sometime, read the end of Acts 14. It's the end of Paul's missionary journey. And as he is sort of reversing course, he's, he's traveled along to all these various cities with Barnabas, and he's passed into what is now modern-day Turkey and Asia Minor. He's faced intense persecution. They tried to put him to death. And as he turns around to go and retrace his steps and go back to where they had established churches in the preceding route and return to Antioch where he had been sent out, they go along and Acts 14 tells us that he encouraged the people and told them, warned them, 
reminded them that through much suffering, they must enter the kingdom. In other words, they weren't to be deluded with thinking, well, this is just Paul that's going to suffer. No, Paul wanted them to remember. He wanted them to be mindful. He wanted them to be aware. This journey to heaven, it's not going to be flowers and ease. Some might think, especially in our generation, uh, about Lady Jane Grey, the Queen of England. Why? Well, why wouldn't the Lord want such a godly person on the throne? If only we could get Jane Grey on the throne of England, all our troubles would be solved. We, we have this believer. They're in this position of power. Think of all they could do. No, no, no. We need to recognize that monarchs, leaders, all the way down to commoners, they're just instruments. They're not ultimate. God doesn't need them to accomplish his purpose. God is going to have the glory for himself and share it with no other from the greatest to the least. Which takes us to our next figure. Just 75 years after Jane Grey took the scaffold to be beheaded, in a little village called Elstow, a boy was born who, who described his own pedigree this way. From my descent then, it was, as is well known by many, of a low and inconsiderable generation. My father's house being of that rank that is meanest and most despised of, all, despised of all the families in the land. Wherefore, I have not here as others to boast of noble blood or of any high-born state according to the flesh. Though all things considered, I magnify the heavenly majesty for that by this door he brought me into the world to partake of the grace and life that is in Christ by the gospel. Not many not mighty, not many noble. But this, this man would receive a, a fairly solid education. He goes on to say, Yet notwithstanding the meanness and inconsiderableness of my parents, it pleased God to put it into their hearts to put me to school, to learn both to read and write, to which I also attained according to the rate of other poor men's children. Though to my shame I confess, I did soon learn that I had learned, I did soon lose that I had learned even almost utterly. And that long before the Lord did work his gracious work of conversion upon my soul. So here's this poor common boy who has an education, at least that which is acceptable to others at his station in life, and yet by his foolishness and, and his own just, just lax attitude, he squanders most of it before he's ever a believer. He goes on and, and he writes this in, in essentially an autobiography, and he describes at length and in great detail that most of his youth was spent in total ignorance and just pursuing sinfulness. He says, as for my own natural life, for the time I was without God in the world, it was indeed according to the course of this world and the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. He says, it was my delight to be taken captive by the devil at his will, being filled with all unrighteousness, the which did also so strongly work and put forth itself both in my heart and life, and that from a child that I had but few equals, especially considering my years, both for cursing, swearing, lying, and blaspheming the holy name of God. In other words, he was a notorious sinner. He, he goes on and describes his, his sinful habits, but he was acutely aware of his sin. This young man walked through life with a regular awareness of his own worthiness of condemnation. So was, such was the atmosphere in which he grew up. Later on, he joined the army. He, nearly escaped, he narrowly escapes death. He had been stationed as a guard on a siege. And at the changing of the guard, when someone else went to take his place, just moments after he left, a bullet was shot and took out that guard in the head where he had been standing moments before. And it shook him for a time and caused him to consider his soul's need before the Lord. And God was working all that time to draw this young man to himself. Around age 20, he married a woman who, we have her name recorded nowhere for us in, in, in his personal history or anywhere else. But he describes her as one whose father was counted godly. This woman and I, though we came together as poor as poor might be, not having so much household stuff as a dish or a spoon betwixt us both. Yet this she had for her part. 
He mentions two books, The Plain Man's Pathway to Heaven and The Practice of Piety, which her father had left her when he died. In these two books, I would sometimes read with her, wherein I also found some things that were somewhat pleasing to me. But all this while, I met with no conviction. She would also, she would be often telling me of what a godly man her father was, how he could reprove and correct vice, both in his house and among his neighbors, what a strict and holy life he lived in his days, both in word and deed. Her influence and testimony of her father eventually did bring conviction on the young man. He began attending church with great regularity, trying to curb his fleshly desires and trying to get some peace for his soul. And all the while he began crying out for the way of salvation. He relates the story of coming upon a group of women. He says, upon a day the good providence of God called me to Bedford to work on my calling, or my, my, my vocation. In one of the streets of that town, I came where there were three or four poor women sitting at a door in the sun talking about the things of God. And being now willing to hear them discourse, I drew near to hear what they said. For I was now a brisk talker also myself in the matters of religion. But I say, I heard but understood not. For they were far above out of my reach. Their talk was about a new birth, the work of God in their hearts. Also how they were convinced of their miserable state by nature. How they... They, they talked how God had visited their souls with his love in the Lord Jesus and with what words and promises they had been refreshed, comforted, and supported against the temptations of the devil. Moreover, they reasoned of the suggestions and temptations of Satan in particular and told to each other by which they had been afflicted and how they were borne up under his assaults. In me thought they spake as if joy did make them speak. They spake with such pleasantness of scripture language and with such appearance of grace and all they said that they were to me as if they had found a new world. He, he describes his response to this encounter and many others like it. Where godly influences from his father-in-law who wasn't even living, the inheritance he had left to his wife, to these women who he just found speaking truth, conversing spiritually with one another, talking about how the Lord was working in their life. He says, at this I felt my own heart began to shake and mistrust my condition to be nothing. For I saw that in all my thoughts about religion and salvation, the new birth did never enter into my mind. Neither knew I the comfort of the word and promise, nor the deceitfulness and treachery of my own wicked heart. And beloved, we have none of the names of those individuals. Again, talk about the base, the things that are not, the things that are foolishness to this world. Eventually, through the teaching of the pastor there in Bedford, Pastor Gifford, and the influences of his people, the Lord redeemed this soul-sick man. After nearly two years of just intense conviction, this is how he records his conversion. One day as I was passing into the field, this sentence fell upon my soul. Thy righteousness is in heaven. And he thought with all, I saw with the eyes of my soul, Jesus Christ at God's right hand. There, I say, was my righteousness. So that wherever I was or whatever I was doing, God could not say of me, he wants or lacks righteousness. For that was just before him. I also saw, moreover, that it was not my good fame of heart that made my righteousness better, nor yet my bad frame that made my righteousness worse, for my righteousness was Jesus Christ himself. Now did my chains fall off my legs indeed. I was loosed from my afflictions and irons. My temptations also fled away, so that from that time those dreadful scriptures of God left off to trouble me. Now when I also home rejoicing for the grace and love of God. In other words, as he considered that there was nothing he could do for his own soul's sake. There was no way he could improve himself to be acceptable or righteous in God's sight. And that all his righteousness was in Christ alone. He felt his burden drop away. Within a few years he would be called to act as a preacher in the congregation there at the Baptist Church in Bedford. Which was not authorized by the English government. And this man though he was basically an uneducated man, would become one of the greatest preachers of that day. One pastor, in compiling testimony of those who came to hear him, writes this. 
When the country understood that the tinker had turned to preach, one man tells us, they came to hear the word by hundreds and that from all parts. A co-maker in London later said, no one preached the New Testament like he. he. He made me admire and weep for joy and give him my affections. When, it, <clears throat> when the laws would, would loosen and he was more free to preach abroad, at a day's notice he would get a crowd of 1,200 to preach, to hear him preach at 7 o'clock in the morning on a weekday. Once, while he was imprisoned, a whole congregation of 60 people were arrested and brought in at night. A witness tells us, I heard this man both preach and pray with that mighty spirit of faith and of divine assistance that made me stand and wonder. And the greatest Puritan theologian contemporary of this man, John Owen, when asked by King Charles why he, a great scholar, went to hear an uneducated tinker preach, he said, I would willingly exchange my learning for the tinker's power of touching men's heart. You may have guessed by now, this man that I've been describing is John Bunyan. The man who, from the lowest obscurity, became a name that most, if not all of us, know at least something about. Bunyan is best remembered for his book, The Pilgrim's Progress, which again, <clears throat> most of us know was written during his time in prison. What most of us don't know or may not be as familiar with is why he was imprisoned. Bunyan had been a believer for just a few years when his first wife died. They'd been married about 10 years and, and they'd had four children. The oldest, a girl named Mary, was blind. Bunyan remarried so, sometime later. But he was called before the local magistrates to explain why he was preaching unlicensed. For years and years, the, the details of this were actually lost. <clears throat> but some time ago, the, the record of the court transcripts between Bunyan and the judge were, <clears throat> excuse me, were recovered. I'm going to read just a section of these this evening. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you, this goes on for a little bit, but when Pastor Philip and I were first talking about doing this series, one of the first things that I said was, I want to do Bunyan. I, I, I want to do this. I want to read this part. The judge asked, Mr. Bunyan, you stand before this court accused of persistent and willful transgression of the conventicle act, which prohibits all British subjects from dissenting themselves from worship in the Church of England and from conducting worship services apart from our church. You come, presumably, <clears throat> with no legal training and yet without counsel. I must warn you, warn you, sir, of the gravity of the charge, the harshness of the penalty in the event of your conviction, and the foolhardiness of acting as your own counsel in so serious a matter. And he goes on to explain, I have all these depositions against you. And he says, what's your response to these charges? Why is it that you haven't been going to the established state church? Why are you holding, why are you holding these, these meetings that are unauthorized? Bunyan responds, thank you, my Lord. I may say that I am grateful for the opportunity to respond. Firstly, the depositions speak the truth. I've never attended services in the Church of England nor I intend ever to do. Secondly, it's no secret that I preach the word of God whenever, wherever, and to whomsoever he pleases to grant me opportunity to do so. Having said that, my Lord, there is a weightier issue that I'm constrained to address. I have no choice but to acknowledge my awareness of the law which I am accused of transgressing. Likewise, I have no choice but to confess my guilt and my transgression of it. As true as these things are, I must affirm that I neither regret breaking the law nor repent of having broken it. Further, I must warn you that I have no intention in future of conforming to it. It is on its face an unjust law, a law against which honorable men cannot shrink from protesting. In truth, my Lord, it violates an infinitely higher law, the right of every man to seek God in his own way, unhindered by any temporal power. That, my Lord, is my response. The judge responded, this court would remind you, sir, that we are not here to debate the merits of the law. We are here to determine if you are, in fact, guilty of violating it. And Bunyan responded, perhaps, my lord, that is why you are here, but it is most certainly not why I am here. I'm here because you compel me to be here. All I ask is to be left alone to preach and teach as God directs me. As, however, I must be here, I cannot fail to use these circumstances to speak against what I know to be an unjust and odious 
odious <clears throat> edict. I first was, was told and, and taught a little bit about Bunyan, began to read things like this uh, when I was in college. And I remember really trying to grapple with, would I do this? Would I do this? Because even some of the other things that were taking place contemporaneous to this, they were still executing people who, who, who didn't agree with the established church system. They were still imprisoning those who wanted to have baptism scripturally by immersion. They were putting those people in prison because they would not toe the line with what they were saying. And I had to, I had to ask myself, do, do I hold that conviction? Do I hold what is scriptural high enough that if it came down to it, would I do that? Because he did. Why did he was, he, was he, was he just foolish? Was he just obstinate? Bunyan made his case before the court that men should have the right to worship according to their conscience. After a great deal of back and forth, the judge asked, you're a tinker by trade, are you not, Mr. Bunyan? He answered, that's correct. The judge asked, would you mind apprising the court of the extent of your formal schooling? And Bunyan said, not at all, my lord. I am able to read and write, and that with great difficulty. The judge responds basically, well, I, I get it now. You're, you're just too ignorant. You're too foolish to understand the weight of what you're saying. He even at different points is going to ask, are, are you sure you're in your right mind? The judge had never heard the things that Bunyan was bringing. But he was interested in what he had to say. And he tries to wrap up the proceedings this way. He says, I do not wish to send you to prison, Mr. Bunyan. I am aware of the poverty of your family. and I believe you have a little daughter who unfortunately was born blind. Is this not so? Bunyan answered, yes, it is, my lord. Very well, says the judge. The decision of the court is this. And as much as the accused has confessed his guilt, we shall follow a merciful and compassionate course of action. We shall release him on the condition that he swear solemnly to discontinue the convening of religious meetings and that he affix his signature to such an oath prior to quitting the courtroom. That will be all, Mr. Bunyan. I hope not to see you here again. May we hear the next case. Bunyan said, my lord, if we have another moment of the court's time. Yes, but be you quick about it. We have other matters to attend to. And Bunyan says, I, I can't do it. I cannot place my signature upon any document in which I promise henceforth not to preach. My calling to preach the gospel is from God and he alone can make me discontinue what he has appointed me to do. As I've had no word from him to that effect, I must continue to preach and I shall continue to preach. The judge starts to lose his patience says the court's trying to be lenient with you. We're, we're trying to, for the sake of your family, we're, we're trying to take it easy on you. He says, do you wish to go to prison? Bunyan, no, my lord, few things there are that I could wish less. The judge goes further and says, very well, we'll, we'll try to good faith, in, in good faith to accommodate what, what's <clears throat> this conviction that you hold. And essentially says, if you'll just get a license... In fact, you don't even have to get the license if you'll just profess that you will only do this. You don't have to go to prison. If you will just make a verbal commitment to proceed through proper channels to obtain licenses, I won't even make you sign anything. He says, can you comply with this condition, Mr. Bunyan? Says, can you comply with this condition, before you answer, mark you this. Should you refuse, the court will have no alternative but to sentence you to a prison term. Think, sir, of your poor wife. Think of your children. And partic particularly, think of your pitiful, sightless little girl. Think of your flock who can hear you to their heart's content when you have secured your licenses. Think of these things and give us your answer, sir. Bunyan responded, my lord, I appreciate the court's efforts to be, as you have put it, accommodating. But again, I must refuse your terms. I must repeat that it is God who constrains me to preach and no man or company of men may grant or deny me leave to preach. These licenses of which you speak, my Lord, are symbols not of a right but of a privilege. Implied therein is the principle that a mere man can extend or withhold them according to his whim. I speak not of privileges but of rights. Privileges granted by men may be denied by men. Rights are granted by God. <clears throat> 
and can legitimately be denied by no man. I must therefore re refuse to comply. The judge, probably with no little anger, responded very well, Mr. Bunyan. Since you persist in your intractability and since you reject this court's honest effort at compromise, you leave us no choice but to commit you to Bedford jail for a period of six years. If you manage to survive, I should think that your experience will correct your thinking. If you fail to survive, that will be unfortunate. In any event, I strongly suspect that we have heard the last we shall ever hear from Mr. John Bunyan. How wrong was he? All told, Bunyan would spend 12 years in prison for the sake of the gospel and for preaching according to his conscience. He would describe it later this way, the parting with my wife and my poor children hath often been to me in this place as the pulling of the flesh from my bones. And that not only because I am somewhat too fond of these great mercies, but also because I should have often brought to my mind the many hardships, miseries, and wants that my poor family was like to meet should I be taken from them especially my poor blind child who lay nearer my heart than all I had besides. Oh, the thoughts of the hardship I thought my blind one might go under would break my heart to pieces. Bunyan would be released from prison with a new act of parliament. The church would be permitted to operate. It would pastor for only about 16 years. And the time was not without persecution. Another outbreak of persecution would actually cause him to be imprisoned again. Finally, age only 59, traveling as part of the ministry of his church to reconcile a father and a son. Bunya would be caught in a rainstorm on his journey home. He would take sick and die shortly thereafter in 1688. His personal property, his belongings at his time of death were minimal. His wealth was nothing compared to the name that he's achieved in the centuries since his death. Spurgeon, who was particularly fond of Bunyan and Pilgrim's Progress, Spurgeon read Pilgrim's Progress every year from the time he was a child, said, prick him anywhere and you will find that his blood is bibline. The very essence of the Bible flows from him. He cannot speak without quoting a text for his soul is full of the word of God. Bunyan is best remembered for Pilgrim's Progress. It's not the only book that he wrote. He wrote on prayer. He wrote <clears throat> that autobiography that I mentioned, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners. He, he wrote another one called The Holy War that one scholar said, if he had not written Pilgrim's Progress, Holy War would be the greatest allegorical Christian book that had ever been written. In other words, he outdid himself to obscurity. But who Bunyan was didn't happen in prison. It just revealed it. It was already there. The boldness with which he spoke to that judge, to that magistrate, it was there before. Bunyan himself, he knew, readily confessed. He, he wasn't anything. He was one of the not many mighty, not many noble, not many wise. He was one of the foolish base things through which the Lord was pleased to work. But he was faithful. He was an instrument in the Redeemer's hands. And so we don't remember Bunyan finally. We remember his God. We remember the great object of his affection, of his devotion. The one for whom he suffered greatly. We remember his God and we devote ourselves to him so that if or when the time comes, we may be faithful as well. So that he, the Lord, alone would receive all the glory from our lives, whether by life or by death. Let our longing be that he is glorified. Will you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for these servants. We thank you for these through whom you have worked, through whom your grace has shown. And Father, we ask that you would strengthen us to be faithful for the time that you have given us.
That though we are not mighty, though we're not wise, though we are not noble, Lord, that you would be pleased to work through us and that it would be clearly seen that our strength is not in ourselves, but it's from you, that you alone would receive the glory for the name of your son. And in his name we pray these things. Amen.